the part about my job that I love the most is talking to patients, spending time with them, explaining, answering their questions um, on more of a human level than sometimes um, that you would get in a busy hospital. Alex McCutcheon says she went into medicine because she wanted to help people. One of my friends had told me, I think you'd be a really good obstetrician. Alex lives in Darwin in Australia's Northern Territory. When she was in high school in suburban Melbourne, Alex looked into becoming a midwife. And at a careers fair, she watched instructors explain the childbirth process. It got to a point during a simulation of a obstetric patient that they said, all right, now this is where we stop. We'll have to go and get the doctor. You'd have to go and get the obstetrician. And I said, yeah, what a... What about that? What Can I do that? And they said, oh, you'd have to go to medical school. So I went to medical school. Fast forward to early 2020, Alex is entering her second year working as a fully qualified doctor when she hears news of a novel coronavirus emerging in China. The first place I heard about it was when I was in Argentina um, in January. And the person that I was backpacking with, he said, oh, have you heard about this coronavirus? And from a, from a science background, I just thought, what are you talking about? What coronavirus? There are, there are a family of viruses. Which particular one are you talking about? And then it just snowballed from there. Patients are already coming to the Metropolitan Hospital with the disease by the time Alex gets back to Melbourne. Because you'd see young patients come in who were COVID positive and you can't help but think, this could be me or this could be a friend of mine or this could be a family member. Um, so it was it was a scary time to work. A few months later, cases are escalating and Alex is working on a general medical ward when she starts feeling off. I was doing a run of seven nights in a row and I was on my seventh night and it was about 2am and I was walking around the wards thinking, oh, I'm a bit short of breath. I shouldn't be. I'm 27. My heart rate didn't drop below 100, so I thought maybe something's up here. And I'd been treating a lot of positive patients throughout the week. Um, And towards the end of the shift, I got really sore all over my body. I couldn't really ignore those symptoms. So I went straight away to go and get tested. The test comes back positive. So Alex goes to a hotel. Australia uses hotels as quarantine centres to try to prevent the coronavirus spreading in the community. About a week into her infection, Alex gets a runny nose and cough And then a few days later, she completely loses her sense of smell and taste. I remember having a green curry delivered to my hotel quarantine and I filmed myself putting my face right up against it and I could not smell a single thing. I could taste that it was hot and I could taste that it had some texture. But beyond that, I could not taste a single thing. And I also put my head in a coffee bag and I smelt nothing. (laughs) a lot of weird videos that came out of COVID quarantine. Alex is eventually cleared to leave quarantine, but her distorted sense of smell and taste persist. More than a year later, she's still suffering the consequences of catching COVID-19. It's unclear how long her symptoms will last, but Alex isn't alone in being plagued by the effects of the coronavirus long past her recovery from the initial stages of the illness. There haven't been any studies published yet estimating the global prevalence of patients like Alex, but at least one in 10 COVID patients have symptoms six months later. So the number of these so-called long haulers could run well into the millions, if not tens of millions worldwide. Once Alex loses her sense of smell, she knows exactly who to contact been a very very fruitful friendship and then obviously when I got the the very sad news that Alex was diagnosed with COVID she uh, Facebook messaged me I think the message said bit of fun news I have COVID. (laughs) You said it'll be right. That's Dr Leah Beecham she's a neuroscientist who studies smell. Alex and Leah are best friends they've known each other for more than a decade. Inside I was panicking Um, and then I asked her if she could smell and she said well I can't taste and then I actually sent her an olfactory kit in the in the hotel because I work with those a lot and I quantified her sense of smell and she did oh abysmally. I spoke with Leah and Alex at the same time in a studio at the University of Melbourne where they both studied. Alex had returned for a short visit. This is the story of two friends, two doctors in fact, who were trying to understand one of the most common signs of COVID-19. 
The loss of the sense of smell or olfaction affects almost one in every two people who get the pandemic disease. Usually it resolves within a week or two. But for some, like Alex, smell and taste distortions persist, leaving an invisible illness that leads to a profound disruption to their daily life that affects their mood and relationships. But scientists are learning that its significance doesn't end there. This is also a story about living with a mysterious condition that may have a lasting impact on health. Evidence is emerging that COVID survivors like Alex could face even worse neurological issues later in life. I'm Jason Gale, a senior editor and chief biosecurity correspondent at Bloomberg News. From the Prognosis podcast, this is Breakthrough. Leah and Alex met just before beginning their first year at university. We were in a car on the way to an orientation camp and we met in the back seat and may have shared a bag of goon. <laughs> and we have been really good friends ever since. Those Best friends. Right? Goon, listeners, is an Australianism that refers to wine that's sold in a plastic bag inside a cardboard box. After that, Leah and Alex stay close throughout undergrad. And then Alex um, popped off to do postgraduate medicine and I popped off to do postgraduate uh, biomedical science. We lived together during our postgraduate years. Our friendship um, is just a tipping balance between beer and science, really. Yeah. Leah now works at the University of Melbourne's Flory Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health. It's one of the world's largest brain research centres. After Leah gets the message about Alex's positive COVID test, she says she wants to see how badly Alex has lost a sense of smell. Scientists have a standardised way of testing one's ability to detect scents and odours. It's a type of scratch and sniff test. It requires users to smell odorant molecules from separate panels in a series of booklets and then indicate which of four multiple choice answers best characterises each smell. Users get a grade out of 40. Alex failed spectacularly. Anosmia and dysgeusia are terms doctors use to describe a loss or impaired sense of smell and taste. People sometimes lose these senses in the early stages of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's diseases, but short-term losses occur more frequently with upper respiratory tract infections. COVID, though, has added another dimension. Leah says we don't really know why the coronavirus results in longer-term effects on smell and taste. Initially, it was thought to be because of inflammation, like the blocked nose you get with a cold. I think it was a symptom that was ignored because it it was very much thought of, you've got a blocked nose, of course you've lost your sense of smell. But then more and more data was coming out about people who had no other symptoms. Their only symptom was a, a loss of smell. They had hyposmia. They didn't even have a runny nose. And we started looking at that data and thinking there was there was more to it. There was also the belief that any lost sense of smell would be recovered within a month. Turns out that was based more on optimism than evidence. A study in the Journal of Internal Medicine in January found almost a quarter of sufferers hadn't recovered their sense of smell after two months. And by six months, 5% were still living with the derangement. And we have no idea why. What we do know is that the coronavirus targets a protein on the surface of cells that line the airways, from the nose to the furthest reaches of the lungs. Inside the nasal cavity, the cells the coronavirus targets are right alongside the nerves that tell the brain what odours are being detected. Leah says it makes the nose a particularly interesting part of the body to study. This area of the nose is fascinating. It's one of the reasons I got into olfactory science in that there are brain cells that project down into that region. So it's actually an area of your body where your central nervous system is exposed to the environment. And that makes that region particularly vulnerable. These nerve cells protrude the bone in the skull that separates the nasal cavity from the brain. The bone is perforated like Swiss cheese. Some scientists contend that the loss of smell in COVID patients results from the virus infecting the nose and causing inflammation there that subsequently damages these olfactory neurons or nerve cells. 
But that doesn't really hold up when you're talking about a year down the, the track. There shouldn't be any more of this acute inflammation. Leah has some other theories. So one is that um, because of these neurons that project into the nose directly from the brain, the virus is actually able to get into those neurons and it's able to get into your brain, therefore causing damage because you have viral particles in your brain. That's one hypothesis. The other is that it's not able to get into your brain, but it can get close enough to those neurons that it can trigger an inflammatory response. Leah says that from there, the inflammatory response can cause a reaction that still harms the brain. Some scientists have published research showing that the virus can get into the brain. Others have published research showing that it can't. Intriguingly, scientists at the Pasteur Institute in Paris described finding the SARS-CoV-2 virus in the cells that line the roof of the nasal cavity in a half a dozen patients who'd lost their sense of smell for months. I spoke with Dr. Pierre-Marie Leto, a neuroscientist who led the study, which was published in Science Translational Medicine back in June. And one of our surprise came when we find, in fact, that for all of them, uh, we could find the presence of the viruses in the sensory organs, explaining why those people were uh, impaired in recovering this sense, which was very surprising for us because several publications at least report that olfactory sensory neurons located in the olfactory uh, organ, where uh, those sensory neurons were not expressing the receptor for the, for the virus. Therefore, they should not be infected. The French scientists found protein made by the coronavirus as well as antibodies against it, but they weren't able to demonstrate that SARS-CoV-2 can replicate in the sensory organ. It's something Pierre-Marie is still exploring because if there's still viable or infectious virus particles there, that could have consequences for transmission. If we're dealing with replicative viruses in the nostril, those people might be contagious. By, by just breathing, they will be uh, spreading the viruses around them. So it's, it's, a, it's a question that we are now uh, following by uh, recruiting more and more people losing chronically their uh, olfactions in order to address this question. So this is under investigation. Leah says there's no agreement among scientists about whether the virus is able to persist in the body, much less the nostrils. I think it's a good theory, though. Leah says it fits with another theory that scientists have mentioned several times in our earlier episodes that involves the consequences of immunisation against the coronavirus. There's anecdotal evidence. None of this is um, published because it's very hard to quantify, but people have come out and said that after they've been vaccinated, they feel their symptoms of long COVID getting better. They are not necessarily fully recovering. And some people notice nothing. Some people feel like they're a bit worse, but there are a large number of people who say, I can actually smell a little bit better two weeks after being vaccinated. And that really lends itself to this reservoir hypothesis because maybe your immune system wasn't able to clear that last little bit of virus that's sitting in your uh, epithelial cells, but a vaccine, which is a much sort of more direct approach um, at boosting the immune system, was able to clear it. So I think it's definitely got legs but I think it's very early on um, and we need many more studies to replicate it for us to say this is actually what's happening. There's still a lot of questions around how long COVID causes us to lose some of our senses. But scientists are accumulating evidence about the virus and its long-term impacts on biological processes such as ageing. There's been a lot of research published documenting the ways in which the brain is damaged following a SARS-CoV-2 infection. There's inflammation, blood clots and hemorrhages, not to mention respiratory failure that can cut off oxygen supply. But another aspect of COVID has surprised researchers in recent months, the loss of brain tissue. That's right, COVID is associated with brain shrinkage. A study in June from the University of Oxford released a head of peer review and publication found grey matter deficits were more likely in patients who'd had COVID than those who were never infected with the coronavirus. It was a unique study that used medical records and brain scans from patients taken before the pandemic. The researchers then invited hundreds of these patients back for another round of MRI brain imaging. Uh, 
There were marked differences between those who'd been infected with COVID-19 and those who had not in terms of grey matter, which is made up of the cell bodies of neurons that process information in the brain. More interesting still, there was a loss of brain volume, even in COVID patients not sick enough to require hospitalisation. The findings haven't been published in a scientific journal, but Leah says the study offers important insights into what might be going on inside the brains of long haulers. This is probably one of the most impressive papers that I've ever read. It is, uh, and what they've shown is that th- quite scarily, actually, there's there's a loss of grey matter in um, a number of regions of the brain. Most of them are related to olfactory and gustatory pathways, which explains why uh, potentially many people are not recovering their sense of smell, or even if they have recovered it, it's not fully recovered. Um, it's because you've actually you've you've actually lost brain tissue in those regions. And uh, there's also some indications that the the limbic region might be involved. Leah says that the part of the brain that COVID appears to shrink affects mood regulation. This might explain why anxiety, depression and brain fog are common symptoms of long COVID. We're seeing huge numbers of anxiety above and beyond what we would have expected in long COVID. But it's not just that COVID can affect mood. Scientists predict that it will also be associated with longer-term neurological problems like dementia. Leah says inflammation caused by COVID essentially primes the brain for further injury down the road. And once your brain is primed, if you get another hit later in life, like another severe virus, viral infection that gets into your brain or you're exposed to a toxin, you're closer to the edge because your brain is primed and it's ready to overfire. And when it does that and the new inflammation takes hold, it's going to kill cells faster. So we're talking here about not COVID causing any of these diseases, but it's just an increased risk factor that we need to be aware of that a very large population of the world has now had. Leah says that because COVID affects so many different parts of the brain and its functions, like memory, it could predispose degenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's. She's particularly concerned about what this could mean for Parkinson's disease too. It's a disorder of the central nervous system that affects movement. About 10 million people worldwide have the condition and the number is growing, in part because age is a major risk factor and humans are living longer. So at the moment, we're actually living through a Parkinson's pandemic. It's doubled in the last 20 years, our incidence, and it's set to double again. And that's after we correct for the ageing population. Now that we've just added COVID in, there's a chance that we have just even the slightest shift of people more likely to get Parkinson's. That could push us into numbers that we can't cope with. Um, Parkinson's is a very long disease. It's a very expensive disease. We don't have disease-modifying drugs. All we can do is help you symptomatically for a few years until that stops working. It's really scary and we need to be really vigilant. There was a surge in cases of Parkinson's disease in the decades following the 1918 Spanish influenza pandemic. Epidemiologists determined that Spanish flu survivors had a two to three times higher risk of developing Parkinson's, now termed viral Parkinsonism, compared with those who didn't get the deadly flu strain. If a similar effect were to occur in the wake of COVID, Leah says it could cripple health systems. There's warning bells and we're, we're trying to listen to those warning bells, I think, because we don't want to be caught off guard. And our community itself would, you know, most people who are diagnosed with Parkinson's are still of working age. We can't lose that, you know, workforce loss. So there's an economic side to it as well. We need to be really prepared. And the only way we're going to do that is to keep studying it and preparing as best we can. As we sit in the studio in Melbourne, Leah and Alex sitting side by side, Alex knows that when Leah talks about the future risks around long COVID, she's talking about pretty frightening things that she could face one day. It's a bit hard to listen to. I have known Leah for a very long time and she's been very frank and honest with me about the research and the places that this could go. That's why I think research like Leah's is so amazing that we can be putting money into finding the exact mechanisms behind how this happens. Why why does one person get more affected than another person? Are there things that they could have changed in their life? Are there lifestyle factors that could have been different that makes them less or more susceptible to a disease and to long-term COVID as well? 
Some of Alex's smell has come back, but she says it's not the same. It's quite sad not being able to smell and taste the things that you have loved before. I was previously quite into my beer and craft beer. I used to brew beer at home and I now don't really like dark beer, which is, it's maybe trivial to some people, but it's really sad to me. I don't like particular foods that I used to make. I make dumplings quite a lot with friends and I can't eat them now because it tastes like COVID. I don't know how to describe what that taste is. It doesn't taste like anything that I've tasted pre-COVID, but it reminds me of a particular time in my life and it doesn't taste good. Alex says she's fortunate her loss of smell hasn't depressed her. I think I've had a lot of support from my friends and family about being able to talk about the ways that it's affected me. It, it has certainly removed a lot of the pleasure in tasting food and I don't get a lot out of fine dining experiences now that other people might find. But I'm also part of a Facebook community of people who have lost their smell and taste. And there are some really tragic stories of people not being able to smell their kids anymore and how much that upsets them and how they're now 16, 18 months down the track from their COVID diagnosis and they still don't get any enjoyment from tasting food. She's clearly concerned about the fact that long COVID might continue to affect her and that the full extent of her infection might not be revealed for decades. I think the respiratory symptoms may play out in the next 10 to 20 years. I don't have a scientific base for that prediction. I I think that as a fit, healthy person that can still run 5Ks if I need to, I don't think my lungs have been that horribly scarred, but I would not rule out getting some kind of interstitial lung disease in my 30s or 40s or 50s, which is really scary. Interstitial lung disease is a pretty horrible condition that causes the development of fibrotic scar tissue. Eventually, the lungs become brittle and resemble honeycomb. In the US, there's already been a big jump in double lung transplants and COVID survivors because of this. I don't want to die prematurely. I don't want to have a chronic disease that leaves me on oxygen at home. That's not the future that I envisage for myself. But I I also know that I'm very lucky in that I don't have a lot of other symptoms of long COVID. So I don't have the memory fog. I don't have the anxiety or depression. I don't have the crippling fatigue. I don't have the motor symptoms yet. So I also feel quite guilty when I talk about losing my sense of smell and taste because I know that so many other people, including my patients that I treated at the time, have it so much worse. Alex says her experience of COVID and its alarming consequences will at least help her be a better family doctor. I think... It's it's scary to know that I might have a shortened lifespan, potentially. I might have Alzheimer's early. I might develop Parkinson's. I might end up on oxygen. But I, I can't change any of these things. I, all I can do is, as a GP in the future, I can look after patients who've had COVID. I can support them through that and just impress upon other people the seriousness of COVID and the importance of getting vaccinated. The legacy of COVID is still emerging and we won't know the full extent of its economic and social impacts or the repercussions on health for decades. But the more we learn about the coronavirus and its after effects, the more it's showing to be an infection we should do whatever we can to avoid. That's it for this episode of Prognosis Breakthrough. On our next episode, my colleague John Lauman goes into a Boston hospital to learn how the pandemic has reshaped health services. COVID is leaving indelible marks, not just on patients, but also on those delivering medical care. I'm hearing more more clinicians now who say, 
I cried all the way to work. I didn't want to get up this morning. I love my job. I usually love my job. I, I don't want to go to work. It's too hard. It's too much. This episode of Prognosis Breakthrough was written and reported by me, Jason Gale. Topher Forges is our senior producer. Kyle Kevin Robinson Jr. is our associate producer. Special thanks to Chris Hatzis. Our theme music was composed and performed by Hannes Brown. Rick Schein is our editor. Francesca Levy is the head of Bloomberg Podcasts. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like this episode, please leave us a review. It helps others to find out about the show. Thanks for listening.